when it comes to warming people up, like you need to get blood flow going. You need to activate the muscle groups that are going to be used in class. And then third and finally kind of practice potentially the skill elements of class, whether that's hip hinging or squatting or pressing or getting upside down. Like you need to think about coaches need to think about a class from like a totality uh, perspective and be like, all right, like what are the main things that are happening in this class? What is going on, everyone? We are back with another episode of the Misfit Podcast. Today, we're jumping into a coach's podcast with an uh, honorary Goon Squad member, uh, special guest, Misfit Jim Portland coach, Mark. What's up? What's going on? And, of course, good old Shrebatron. Hey, you stuck with me. Fuck. God, never <laughs> been so irate my whole fucking life. Um, before we get going, the question of the day is, and this, I guess, pertains to the topic of the day, is what is your favorite type of class to coach? Um, by that, I mean like just the lift, just conditioning. It's like conditioning where we specifically haze people. It's like skill work. What do we, what do we like here? For I'm going to lean towards hazing people and <laughs> I'm going to tell you why. And it's not because that's necessarily the most effective, like fitness hour. Cause some people just aren't going to embrace the fact they're going to hell and they're going to, I mean, going to hell in the work. I'm not actually Want to give, give an you know example? Give so, an like example. an example would be something like today's affiliate class. Like our affiliate class today is uh, six rounds on a three-minute clock. You have to do a forty or a thirty-two cal row, and then you have max shuttles in the remaining time, and you get some rest, and you do it a few times. And just the watching athletes go through that shared experience of pushing themselves and using one another to kind of dig deeper than they would if they ever were alone, and just like doing things they would never ever do if they weren't in the presence of other people. There's a lot of magic in that. And it's like a really cool element of class and a really cool element of CrossFit when people like willingly sign up and pay for the ability to come get hazed by class because they realize that we're not gonna do that all the time, but it's an essential ingredient in their fitness. And I think we've done a really good job at our gyms of explaining that it's, this isn't just for our entertainment because if that was the only reason we did it, that would be a pretty poor reason to put that into the programming. But I just really like the element of shared suffering and the like camaraderie that's created in the gym. And I find that's probably one of the most effective ways to make the community tighter is because they've gone through an experience like that together, which is why I think it's so cool. Mm. See, I defined hazing as like bike sprint day. Like I want you to light your hair on fire. You're going to roll around. You're, there's a at least one in ten. One in ten of you is going to go outside and vomit. Like that's what I define. I don't think today's. That's today's, why Mark's on the podcast. Was, fitness, now yes, I got it. <laughs> and my <nice> segue. <laughs> uh, okay, fair enough. What do you got, Coach? I mean, it's cliche, but it's definitely like a send piece. Not quite like today, like a like a one round, you know, twenty calorie air runner, twenty bar facing burpees. And just like explaining to someone that we rarely ask you to go there, yeah. but like today's the day yeah. and, and watching someone access that for the first time gets you so jazzed up. Yeah. Yeah. Mm, okay. Yeah. I like, I do like coaching those days. I also like L coaching sits. the L sit. <laughs> yes, no. The, um, I do. I like coaching the kind of CrossFit, the merry-go-round days when we have like the Metcon. That's like a 20-minute AMRAP and like three movements where it's like accessible movement, accessible movement, accessible movement. Um, maybe there's like gymnastics and stuff in there, but uh, I just like. I think people do get to push themselves. I think the common theme here is like everybody gets to kind of everybody gets to play along. Like none of us were like, oh, I like the. Amanda day the squat snatch muscle up day because that's like that can be tricky but yeah I kind of like the, the CrossFit the, the merry-go-round days especially when it's like a like a classic CrossFit workout where there's like it's kind of a blend of both of your guys thing where it's like it's like this is gonna suck because it's classic CrossFit and because it's highly accessible yeah and I think on a day like that one of the elements I really enjoy and this is something that I think we'll sort of get into as one part of our topic today but like in a class like that when you have three accessible movements and like everyone can kind of play along you get the opportunity to be like all right we've worked together for a while this is how you get the best workout and you go around to somebody else this is how you get a good workout mm. and that might not be the same yeah. advice for both of those athletes but like to me that's a chance for a coach to show off their coaching acumen and basically make sure everyone feels like they got their own personal workout even though the whole fucking room is doing the same thing right and that that way that kind of goes back to the original roots of crossfit where it like started in a you know one-on-one -on -one setting and then it's like hey do you mind if i bring one friend and now it's two on one and then before you know it's classes that element i think is what needs to separate um or should be 
thought about when you're trying to make a class like that that can feel kind of vanilla much more personal and much more effective for everybody because again you can give general blanket statements to the room like hey the shuttle runs are where you're going to kind of keep your heart rate down or like hey always try to do the six deadlifts unbroken but then there's that element of like i've said it to the room and now i'm going to come around to my athletes that i've had you know experience with and seen them move through workouts and be like you hang on to the barbell today. Wait, you just said do that in three sets. Like, not you though. Right, that's yeah. a general statement for you to get better at this. This is what you have to do. And I think that's a, a fun part of the class that you just right. described. Um, cool. So the kind of segueing into the topic of the day, it is components, components of a good and effective, like let's say above average CrossFit class. So what, what kind of separates good, just a generally good, CrossFit class from like, a, wow, that was like an exceptionally, exceptionally run, exceptionally coached. That was fun to participate in. What are the components that make that up? And you, Mark, sent me a text. This is kind of along those lines of like what delineates kind of a good coach from like, or, or just a coach from like, an, or rather let's, what delineates like a time manager from a coach, right. coach being like the like that's what you're striving for. But if you're someone, or if you have it, if you're at an affiliate where it's just like someone kind of like points at the whiteboard and says like, that's the warm up, go do it. That's the workout, get ready to go and go do it. That's like on the, on the bottom end of the that's spectrum. That's the time manager. That's the time <laughs> manager. You, sh you shouldn't pay for that. Right. Um, so I'll kick it to you first. What What's like a, what do you kind of start us off with something that you define as like a component to a good, a good class? Yeah. So without getting into like the really abstract stuff, like, oh, you got to care, all that stuff. Mm. Like a really brief intro, I think is so vital. Mm. Um, it's likely less words than you think it needs to be when you're up there. Um, I, I don't want to spend too much time talking about what you shouldn't do, right? That's a CrossFit coach thing too, not spending much time there. But um, I think as people evolve and you start to learn about CrossFit and you look at the board and you understand cardio, gas, stimulus, what we're looking for, you read it, you know, you think how many sets something should take. There's just too often that we get a little fancy and we, mm. I'm saying like in our gym and at other gyms that uh, I've seen around here, like in terms of what needs to be said people's attention span is like that so and you're you're a you're a morning coach too you got the 5 a.m right. 6 a.m fog is rolled in where it's like <laughs> it's like i'm still asleep when i like coaches right. talking yeah so i mean if if i look up at the clock and it's like been six minutes and no one's moving yet we're talking like full disaster so <laughs> i think i'll just start with the component straight up sure, yeah probably less words than you think at the whiteboard yeah, that's actually been a, a topic at our own gym specifically because we have people who are very thorough and wanted to kind of describe either the events in the gym or how movements should be done. And like, you can just go into this long diatribe about that, but you're, you're right. Attention spans are short. Like when we go to the whiteboard, it should be quick and actionable. And like, you know, they can read the board. You don't need to read the workout to them, but you might point out one or two things that you think is interesting or that they should pay attention to. But again, when you go to the whiteboard, it's basically... Hey, how's your father? And then here's the work. Here's the workout. <laughs> here's what our goal is today. And let's start. Like I've, I made it a goal recently, like actually as of the new year to try to be better about my time management, because I am the coach that typically does a very thorough job on the front end of class. And that sometimes pushes me right up to the end of my timeline, which if you've exercised someone all the way up to the end of their class and you think they're going to hang around and do the necessary steps to get themselves back to planet earth so they can come back around and train hard the following day, you're, you're looking at like a one in 15 or a one in 20 rate. Like you'll get a couple of those folks who get it and like really care enough to do that. But like, if you don't build in that time into your class, it's more than likely not going to happen. So one of the ways I've been trying to combat that is not spending much more than like three minutes at the whiteboard. And again, there are going to be days where you need to spend a bit more, but most days you reading the whiteboard over and over and over again, I found that when I repeat myself more, people pay attention less. So I try to say it once and then move on to something else. Yeah, the I think the what you were saying about <clears throat> just stuff that we've been working on internally is is a lot has a lot has to do with like coaches just having a lot of information and we go over programming every week and it's like how 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 far into the weeds do we get as far as like what we're presenting with people up at the front and I think it can be there can be a there's a kind of distinction between maybe what gets taught 
at like let's say let's say the L1 or something like that where there's a lot of information that you might want to present somebody but then remembering that you are probably standing in front of the same people every single day or those people have been to at le- you know they 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 they're familiar they're familiar with your gym they're a regular member they it's like If you don't have chest to bar pull-ups, it's chin over bar pull-ups. Like, yeah, check. Like, I've heard that 86 times. We don't necessarily need to go down the rabbit hole of every single thing. Um, Because, yeah, it does, it, the, the attention span of your average person, I would say, not even like CrossFitter, but anytime you're getting briefed on something like that, where it's like, maybe someone rolls in a couple minutes late. Someone is like, you got a couple people who are chatting. Well, I couldn't hear what coach was saying. I was looking at the ceiling. It's like you get like a paint. Yeah. Like attention spans (laughs) drop precipitously, like every minute, you know, you're past 60 seconds at the whiteboard. Uh, especially if like you, you know, people know what the workout is in advance. They generally know what they're talking about. Um, or what you're going to say, it's like, let's fucking get moving. There's a sect of your population, and I'm not saying this is the majority, but there's a good like a slice of the pie of people who literally the only fucking movement they do all goddamn day is in your class. That's the only yep. part of their day that's active outside of walking into the office, out of the office, into their home, out of their home. Like, they don't have a lot of activity. So again, while it's important to make sure that you're clear and people don't understand the objectives and how to do things safely, which are all parts of your class, like if you're repeating the fact that your holiday party is on the 12th for the 17th class in a row, like mm, people yeah. get it. And that's something we were making a joke yeah. of in our own internally because like, hey, like they can read the right-hand side of the whiteboard. Like you can just point like, hey, those are the announcements. Yeah, the those holiday the- party's <laughs> been updated since October of <laughs> last year. Yeah. Like we don't need to, you don't need to tell everybody like exactly. when it is and how to sign up for it. Uh, all right, I kind of like the, the direction that we just created, which was we start at the whiteboard. Let's kind of proceed through a normal class. So we've done the, we've done the, uh, we've done the whiteboard brief. We've got people moving hopefully pretty quickly so that, you know, attention spans are there now, now we're moving. So let's talk like, you know, whether it's doesn't really matter whether it's a lift or conditioning or, or whatever's coming up or skill work. Like we're obviously starting to warm people up. What are we thinking as far as, as far as how to effectively warm people up, maybe do like do's and don'ts, so the to speak. Two things that are come to mind immediately are the the warm up is a effective, meaning we'll talk about the goals in here in a second, and two, it's safe. Like you're not having athletes do bounding box jumps as part of their warm up. So generally speaking, we'll tell our our coaches here, and we've discussed this internally, and something that you all should steal is that like when it comes to warming people up, like you need to get blood flow going, you need to activate the muscle groups that are gonna be used in class, and then third and finally kind of practice potentially the skill elements of class, whether that's hip hinging or squatting or pressing or getting upside down. Like you need to think about, coaches need to think about a class from like a totality uh, perspective and be like, all right, like what are the main things that are happening in this class? And then what things can I do that I could check in the boxes of again, warming tissues up, activating tissues and making sure you practice range of motions right. in a way that makes sense. You know, you don't ask an athlete to kick up into a handstand and then say, all right, then we're going to go ride the bike for three minutes afterwards. It's like, mm, flip those two things. So like someone's body warms up before you ask them to get into that range of motion. Sure. So, so order of operations matters. Order of operations bit. matters. And just taking the extra, like, I don't even know how long it takes five minutes at most. Just like sit down, look at your workout and be like, all right, like what things are going to cause sticking points for athletes? Is it they're not warm enough so they can't get up below parallel or they're not getting enough reps of squatting in the warm up so they can actually squat clean the correct way? Or, you know, am I asking them to try to do a muscle up workout and we didn't even hang from the rings yet or hang from the pull up bar. So yeah. those are some of the elements I think about. So I want to make sure again, people are generally warm and that ensures that the warm up is both effective and safe. Yeah. Uh, this is a hot topic for me cause I got it so wrong this morning in one of my classes mm, and that do is, tell. Oh, on, yeah. do tell. and that is the energy system in which you're working out sure. and how you might tailor a warm up to that. So if we take just on face value, what Sherb just said, like I did a warm up this morning that was like the joints through the range of motion. We did some lunging, you know, we uh, did some ankle pumps. We be, in- For the listener, we're rowing and shuttle running today. Yeah. Those are the two movements in the entire rowing class. Rowing and shuttle. So, so uh, it's like all the joints are through the range of motion. I feel pretty good. I messed up my timeline. 
And I just, the, the way people looked in class mm. was a direct result of my lack of heart rate in the warm up. Yeah. And I watched people go into round two and like everyone looked a little sloppy in this workout. Let's be honest. Yeah. It was like a tough one. But I just was like watching a sea full of people operate below what they should have because the warm up just wasn't there. Yeah. And so I think, you know, whether it's like, the, the send example, are we going to marry go around you for 20 minutes? Like it's not just joint range of motion, but it's like what energy system am I going to be pulling off of and what needs to be primed? Yeah, we need to, to fuel, that. fuel, get, get red blood cells oxygen to the, so that we can deliver oxygen to muscles, especially when it's a workout where it's like, it is predominantly aerobic or like it's, it's predominantly a cardiovascular workout, I guess would be the the right way yeah and you know honestly mark you told me about that like right before i had hopped in the sauna and you know sauna you don't do anything besides like sit and drip and then think a little bit and i was like you know the two things i could take away from what mark said is that one he made an error he saw that there and then like, that's just that'll happen you know coaches will potentially guess wrong with what they think is going to be the point of emphasis and in this example you thought like you know everyone rose pretty hard but like where you get it because the score is the run in this workout like if you can push the run a bit more so hey i'll get them ready for running did you make the same mistake at 615 no and that's a huge part here too, is that like a big element of coaching is test and retest the same way we ask athletes to test and then retest. So if you do something in your class and you coach back-to-back -back classes and you don't fucking like it, or maybe you don't like it, or you're not coaching again, you didn't like it. You can tell your fellow coaches what you did so they don't make the same mistake is a huge part of what makes a coaching community more effective and make sure that your classes, you know, are more effective in the future. And again, been coaching for going on, I don't know, 12 years. I can't even tell you how many times I made that mistake. And it's be not because of lack of care. It's because you thought it was going to go one way and it went another way. And then all you do in that situation is then reconstruct it and be like, all right, like what part should have been more emphasized? And like you said, 615, a little bit more running, uh, a little bit more rowing focus, a little bit more heart rate focus and a much more effective class at that hour. There's also a lot of, a lot of kind of <clears throat> um, elements that aren't necessarily black and white as far as like what what group of athletes do you have do you have a, a younger like spry group of athletes that may, may need a different may need different uh different elements of a warm-up than maybe an older group that needs to spend more time kind of working through ranges of motion and stuff like that is everybody at the gym super sore from like the week before like early a couple days ago it's like every you know every every once in a while you have members come in and it's like if i hear one more time that your legs are sore like i'm, I'm gonna, gonna cut I'm your gonna legs off your legs sore i'm gonna make your <laughs> legs more sore um but it's like okay so do we need to tailor the warm-up or something to or change something in order to prepare athletes given like an extenuating circumstance um all right misfits just a quick break in the coaches podcast to talk a little bit about the programming but probably more importantly to you learn how you can save some cash on your affiliate programming we have done a lot of affiliate programming in our day and both of us here talking, Sherb and I, have uh, experienced the competitive side of CrossFit and the affiliate side of, of CrossFit. And I'll tell you what, like the programming works for all spectrum of athletes, whether you're a quarter, you have athletes who are kind of competing for the open and quarterfinals, or you've got the athletes who are just fresh out of beginner's class and trying to get their health and wellness back on track. The programming works for just about everyone. Warm ups, lifting, gymnastics, conditioning, and competitor extras six days a week, along with coaches' notes, the stimulus, how to scale stuff, basically everything that you need to make sure that you can provide a well rounded class to your affiliates is included in your affiliate programming. Sure. Hit them with the deal. Well, since we believe in it so much, and since you might be hesitant to try it out, we're hitting you with 50% off your first month. You can head to either teammisfit.com or the Sugar Bar Marketplace. Use the code word Misfit Podcast to save 50% on your first month. Check it out. See what Hunter's talking about here. Because again, there are a lot of excellent resources on that site, and we try to provide you with the best possible hour of fitness for your affiliate members. Check that out. All right, back to the show. The only thing I'd add to that is the something that I've kind of been a little bit more diligent and tried to also emphasize with the coaches is like they're in like the general warm up. I don't I, I generally try to shy stay away from like complex movements. So you you won't see me ask people to do like power position squat snatch even with like a PVC pipe without first providing the instruction required to do that. There might be warm ups where it's like we're going to steadily move through like you know, three rounds of a barbell related warm up, but that doesn't happen 
until like I've already led those people through the instruction. Cause I've also watched on certain days, maybe we don't do a barbell specific warm up, and it's like, and I'm like, okay, we focused on this movement. So today you're on your own to warm up your power clean or your snatch or whatever. And for whatever reason, in a lot of to- instances, it's like nobody has ever gone through a snatch warm up before. It's like com- we completely forget how to do it. And the like, people don't move very well. It's like the more complex the movement, the more time you need to give coach instruction on that movement. And so I don't put it in like a general warm up. It's not going to be like, this was the workout. All right, guys, here's the warm up. It's got, you know, power position, squat snatches, even with a PVC pipe, because people need to, people one, like, probably blacked out during while I was talking about it. And two, like it's not, it's a complex movement that I would rather instruct. And maybe instead it's like PVC pipe overhead squats to get people loose and warm. And then you go into like the more specific movement kind of instruction and breakdown. And a really easy way to accomplish a lot of the same motor patterns you'd want in a power position squat snatch. You could ask an athlete, Hey, you're going to do a box jump and try to land in a squat. How much easier is that to tell someone than here is power position, here's where your hands are, here's where your knees are, here's where your torso is, all right, go, as opposed to be like, all right, you're going to start with your knees bent, and when you jump on the box, I want you to try to land as deep a squat as you can. And you accomplish the same range of motion, the same activation, in a way that's much easier for the average person to follow along with. And it's like a three-second instruction instead of what you just described, which is, again, a a part of class that should happen. You should be teaching skills. That should be a huge part of your job. But like, maybe you don't want to spend 10 minutes on the front end. And again, like Mark said, you don't want people standing around listening to you talk and talk and talk because that's an easy thing. And that's something we've been working on as a internally as a group here. Is it like, mm-hmm. because we know so much, we try to do that every single class and you'd be better off delivering, trying to deliver one thing to the group and try to hammer that one point, for the entire group, that class, because that's next time when it comes back around, because we like to do that high CNS lift that comes back around every single week pick something new next week. The week after that, pick something new. And after, you know, if you take seven weeks and every week is one new element of that lift and they build those victories on top of one another, by the end, you have a dramatically different movement that's done much better than it was in week one. And you just didn't vomit words onto them for 15 minutes at the front of every single class. And everyone's like, this place, all we do is listen to people talk. It's always a good spread of people who want to know like exactly what it is they're doing, why they're doing it. And maybe even farther, like give me some nuanced about teaching this. And then there's the other end of the spectrum that's just like squatting got it don't know what my percentages are don't care i'm going to sit down and stand up however many times you tell me to and i think providing instruction that leans more maybe towards that that like give me the basics sort of thing and then as you're walking around or you're talking to people you know which athletes like a little bit more of the 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 nitty-gritty details or you can answer you have the capability to answer those questions but you're not necessarily like you said kind of vomiting it over everyone where only a handful of people actually want that very like detail high level level and that's actually one of the things i have on my list of components is like you learn something and again, you don't need to learn velocity angles of a snatch. Like and the most people are gonna be like fucking you miss mean, me that you noise. Teach athletes something. Teach like, them so, something. So, like yeah. so in your example, if an athlete's like, hey, I just wanna have a good squat session, all right. If your feet are flat, you're gonna be better at squatting. That's a pretty basic cue that someone can get better at squatting and if they're not their feet aren't flat. Or you can say, Hey, create external rotation through your hips. And then some athletes are gonna be like, huh? So like right. re- recognizing your audience and realizing that like just like you said a moment ago, like coaches should have the acumen to be able to explain it to the casual two day a week CrossFitter who doesn't really give two shits other than the fact that like their uncle told them it's healthy to go to CrossFit. So they go now and they are starting to like it and maybe haven't fully bought in yet. And then you have those lifers who come in five days a week and want to know how to get that extra 0.1%. A coach needs to have that range to be able to help people on both ends of those things. And Typically, in my experience, people gravitate towards one or the other end of that spectrum. And if you're not good at the other one, you need to figure out how to deliver that same information. Because again, if you're super sciencey and jargony with that person who comes twice a week, they're going to stop coming. And if you give that person who wants all that extra explanation, like, hey, put your feet here. They're like, yeah, I know you've told me that 84 times. That's not a good experience either. So like learning something can be it's such a broad topic. It can be how to pace. It can be how to do the movements, how to transition through movements. And that's one of the things I try to think about when I deliver a class, it's like what's the one thing I could get everybody to learn from today? Like, for example, we had pike handstand pushups, something we don't nip typically do for handstand pushup scales, but we're like, you know, fuck it, well, let's do it for a class. Let's people try this because it allows someone to practice pressing in that plane without their full body weight. 
And the one thing I was trying to get athletes to understand, the same thing we want in a handstand push-up, is that when your arms get to full extension, your arms and ears are in a straight line with one another when you're upside down. And that like blew people's minds. Like, wait, this isn't just like a push-up with your knees on the box? It's like, no, 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 this is inversion. And a lot of athletes took something from that class, right. whether they were people who had great handstand push-ups or had never been even near upside down yet. It was an opportunity for all of that athletes to understand potentially a skill that applies to the highest expression of the handstand pushup, but also teaches someone who's maybe you know years away from a handstand pushup, here's something you could do to start working on them now. Yeah. Mark talking kind of like moved on to kind of let's say skill, whether it's a gymnastics, it's like let's say there's a gymnastics movement or like a or it's a lift. I guess you you choose your own adventure here. What are we what are we focusing on? Yeah, so <clears throat> one of the things that um I've seen I've probably have the experience that not a lot of you have is I've gone to a lot of local gyms around here, like more recently. Just local like, area. Yeah, Maine, local Portland, area yeah. in Maine. Um, and I think when you need to show a movement, and this might sound so simple to some people, but when you watch coaches not do this, you're like, ugh. Um, when demoing something, making your best attempt at having a member in the class demo the movement you're looking to do instead of doing it yourself. Okay. So this is specific to um, lifting and gymnastics, but like we can even bring this back to the warm up when it's like the power that seems to be given away when you're like, okay, so this is the a frame toe touch. And then like, you're getting down the, you're like putting the remote down and you're showing it versus like, Hey, Julie, can you show me the a frame toe touch real quick? And just the, the vibe in the room, um, is, is just different when you can find those. And you can't always, like, you might have a class and you're like, I don't know if anyone knows what I'm talking about. Um, but boy, if you are doing an evaluation and you see two classes side to side, the one where the coach is having someone demo is just so much better. Yeah, I think that's a really, that's a good point. That's a useful skill. It's also, I think it, like, I think you, what you're saying is like it also comes from almost a like a public speaking, public addressing perspective where, you know, you tell when when you're teaching or learning how to speak publicly, it's like you're obviously making eye contact with the audience, but you're like talking to one person at a time, right? You like as I'm speaking, I'm looking at Sherb for a couple of seconds and I'm going to look at Mark for a couple of seconds. And that just kind of confirms that these people are paying attention. You can also see who's not paying attention, right? And maybe mm. ask, like, I like to do that. Like if I explained, hey, this is how a workout goes and like, okay, go to the bathroom. Everybody comes back. Everybody's kind of ready to go. I'll ask a random person. I'll be like, hey, what are you doing right now? And the, sometimes they'll be like, this is what I'm doing. And that just confirms that what you told them was received or it's an opportunity to one, make fun of someone who wasn't paying attention a little bit. That's, an old, <laughs> that's a favorite of mine. But more importantly, to make sure everybody's on the same page with what, what the fuck's about to happen. Um, I do. Kind of, I like what you said about learning something. And I think that can apply in a lot of different ways. So we did our first five by five back squat. I'll just give an example. Um, first five by five back squat day in this phase we have um, historically we'll do that as like five sets of fives at X fixed percentage. And over the years, we've learned that that doesn't work for everyone it works for most people but there's the outliers who are either exceptionally powerful and it's like i might that might even be too heavy for me or more likely it's a crossfitter maybe someone from an endurance background is just like that's simply not heavy enough for me to receive the stimulus the exact stimulus that we're after and so it was five sets of five squatting and i put everybody on a four minute clock which means there's about 30 seconds of work and about three and a half minutes of everybody staring at each other um so it was like, okay, I'm going to grab, I'm going to before class, write up a little whiteboard and we're going to talk about neuromuscular efficiency, which is the, the reasoning why some people may be able to back squat 10 reps at 90% of their one rep max versus someone who, uh, we had Keenan in class who can, he squats, squats like house, four, yeah. 450, um, and he's not going to be able to squat, you know, 410 for 10, 10 times. Like he'd die probably. <laughs> Um, Probably. but to no fault of his own, but it's important because there, the, and a couple of our members were talking about that. They were like, yeah, I wondered, cause it was like, so-and-so is able to squat so much more than me. We have the same max, but they can squat more than me for five. Like what gives? So it was an opportunity to educate people as well as kind of like, you know, with a movement, like a back squat, which we do so frequently. And I've got a class of people who <clears> like, they're all, they've all been here for at least a year or so. And it's like, okay, we don't necessarily need to break down the the fine granular details of the back squat, but 
here's something that you probably didn't know that you might be able to use moving forward. Yeah, I mean, I'm thinking about yesterday's class. We had an AMRAP with deadlifts and bar face and burpees. And, you know, you might go down the route of like teaching them about their physiology. You might be like, hey, this here's a really basic thing. Workout starts with 15 bar facing burpees. If you do 15 bar facing burpees and look at the clock and it says 45 seconds, you fucked up and the workout's over. <laughs> Pace yourself. And I think, again, you can go very far and like you just talked about, like neuromuscular efficiency is a really, really cool topic that I think, you know, interests you and you try to find a way to communicate sure. that to everybody else so they can kind of, you know, maybe gravitate and learn something about themselves from that perspective, a little bit more sciencey, or it might just be like, hey, I've been in your shoes. I know what happens when you do this. I've done a workout like this. Here's my perspective. Or Here's better, my experience. Better yet, like, hey, I did this workout earlier today. <clears throat> this is what happened to me at like, because what you had a pretty good experience with that too, right? You said like, oh, that wasn't too bad until like the nine minute mark. And then at the nine minute work, that got atrocious, atrocious. or whatever. So yeah. it's like you have that if you take the class, if you have the experience doing it, that one, I think it just resonates with people better. It's like, oh, one coach just did the workout like you guys know how much we like to exemplify and, and make sure that like coaches are doing class but you also just have an element of like hey i've done this this is what i found you take into consideration my fitness level versus your fitness level and you hopefully can communicate like you know basically like how to how to best how to get the most out of whatever you're about to do yeah, and my point was being like again you can go the super sciencey route or you can go the more basic route experiential route like i don't want a coach to get hung up on the fact that they might not know a lot about strength and conditioning or like have a big background in exercise science yeah, like sure. i don't know what the fuck to say to people it's like talk about what you know then talk about things that you would do in this workout talk about things that you've experienced or where you thought you slowed down or where you sped up and that's like a huge component of what i've been trying to get because i'm onboarding some coaches over at the uh, the Wyndham gym and that's a big part of it because you know they're going through their whiteboard brief and they were doing exactly what we talked about earlier on where they were just reading off the whiteboard and i'm like they can read don't do that what what would you do what would you say about you if you had just done this workout what would you tell them about your experience and how could you teach them that way it's just a more effective way and it helps build rapport those athletes see that you do what they do. You don't do something special, unique off to the side that's completely different. And they're like, why the fuck would I do this gym? I can go do what he does. And it's like, we are different people. And this is a time and place for these things. But like creating that bond between you and your athletes, being like, I'm no better than you. I do the same shit you do is a huge way to kind of build your street cred in the gym or build your acumen so that people realize that like you have their best interests in mind. You're not giving them advice that you wouldn't give yourself. I think especially when it comes to to CrossFit specifically, like the nature of the, like the, the program as a whole, like the strength and conditioning program. So many of like the rules and like suggestions that you might find in a textbook are like, man, this doesn't really apply to, it doesn't apply <laughs> as much to CrossFit because it's like, okay, there's a rule about, you know, 70 to 80% for three reps or so on the, on the, on the deadlift is like, on, 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 a, on a major lift is like where you're going to find that sweet spot for strength development. It's like, okay, well, I've got 15, 12, 9 deadlifts at 50% of my one rep max and burpees. Like, what the fuck does the textbook say about that? It's like, it doesn't, it's being you know, written. What, what, you know, <laughs> what happens to your energy? Like, energy systems apply when you're, you know, working for continuously. And it's like, okay, that's easy to apply for like a track workout. But what happens when it's like, okay, I'm going to ask you to bike really hard, something that you can do. And then you're going to get slowed down by these ring muscle ups. And then you're going to kind of slog through some lunges. And then you're going to get back on the bike and you're going to feel like, shit but it's going to feel different than the last time because of x y like there's it's it's much more kind of empirical than it is than it is like hard science uh, and and you know written down somewhere so i think having that experience as a crossfit coach whether it's just having spent a lot of time doing crossfit or and or coaching it but also like doing the actual workouts that your athletes are going to do so it's like cause you still we still all get surprised by workouts every once in a while it's like oh that's that is not what I expected to happen or I expected X, Y, or Z and maybe A, B, and C happened. I also have a, a wrinkle here. That learn something goes in your direction too, not just to your athletes. You're not just teaching your athletes. You should be learning something from your athletes in every single class. So one of the things that is a topic of mine that kind of goes hand in hand with learning something is that your workout is safe, but not too safe, right? If, if things are so sterile that everyone's perfectly safe at all times, we're not probably, we're not chasing intensity. And I'm not saying this is our license to just go full speed all the time. But, you know, you try to find that balance between technique and intensity they talk about in all the old level one lectures over and over again. And you as a coach have an opportunity to test the hypothesis. You say, 
this workout RX is the deadlifts are at 185, but your deadlift max is not 500. So we're gonna use 145 and then you do the workout and you get 40 reps more than everybody else. I made a mistake and I should have given you more credit and I should have made you go 165 instead of 185. So part of what I think a coach needs to be able to do too when delivering this class and kind of teaching their members is to then absorb that information to not make the same mistakes twice. Some of the way we talked about with your warm up, you didn't make the same warm up mistake twice in a class. And the same goes for how you scale people, how you make sure people are moving correctly, how you make sure they get the intention of the workout. You should be reflecting after your class and asking yourself like, you know, there's oh, there, there's a good chance that someone's gonna be an outlier and either don't wanna try all that hard and have the same workout. And that's one of the reasons why they're not everybody else. But like more often than not, like 85 to 90% of your class should all be around the same score, the same time. And if they're not, look back at yourself and be like, all right, what could I have done to make sure that they got the same workout or a similar workout as somebody else? And I think that reflection piece, because a lot of gyms go back to back to back to back classes, doesn't happen and doesn't happen enough so that that mistake doesn't fester and continue to be a thing that happens over and over again for an extended period of time. Think yeah, that's, I'll just yeah, I'll just yeah. say that there there's a certain amount of like risk assessment that has to be made as a coach. Not so much let's remove the word like safety from risk, but if you're just always giving people the plan, which is like pace this real well, it's going to be safe. Like you're just facilitating an hour of fitness. I think. For me, one of the things that like kind of let me take the next step was being comfortable giving someone an instruction that they might fail at. Mm. Like if the workout's nine bar muscle ups, I know you can't do nine bar muscle ups. Like how about let's scale the number down to five and I'm going to force you to do the five rounds unbroken. You don't know if you can do that. The athlete doesn't know if they can do that. You might not be able to do it, but yeah. like that's the wrinkle I'm inserting that might not work out. And I think when you can assess those moments of risk, um, that's when someone has a great experience and is like, I've never done five bar muscle ups before in a row, let alone in a workout. And that just separates like you facilitating a safe hour of fitness. So it's balanced. Well, it's also, you know, it's a nice segue into ways to scale people. Like sometimes scaling someone isn't just like you can't do 10 bar muscle ups or do chest of bar pull ups. It's like, right. Hey, everybody that can do this movement as prescribed, we'll do this in 30 to 75 seconds. You get 75 seconds, get as many as you can. And round one, you might get seven. And round two, you might get five. Round three, you might get three. But you did way more bar muscles than you would have done if I had just said, you're gonna do three every single time. And again, knowing when to do that is an important skill for a coach. Knowing when it's time to allow an athlete to struggle or flounder or they should be going around and around. That's another big reason why it's important that we talk about like how the workout should go in a nuts and bolts fashion that isn't reading the whiteboard. It's like, here's where you get stuck. Here's where you push. Here's where you break things up. And then you go around like we talked about earlier in the podcast individually with athletes and say, you know what? I gave a blanket statement to the general room. Here's what I want you to do individually. And that extra like layer of going above and beyond to talk to that person individually, which is something you should be doing in all of your classes, makes them feel special and make sure that they get the best possible version of that workout for themselves. I mean, to your point, Mark, we did our we did our gym survey at the end of the year and one of the one of our newer coaches, Jen, got some got props because uh, one of the members was like, I love taking uh, I think they were talk I think they said Hunter and Sherb's class, but occasionally they'll overscale me or they'll say like, Hey, that we think I think this is the right weight to use, not all the time, but like the other the on a, a, a more recent experience that was like fresh in her mind was like, Well, Jen, one of our newer coaches, looked at me and was just like, No, fuck it, send it. What's the worst that could happen? And she was like, Okay, I guess I'm using this weight, I guess I'm using the RX weight or more, maybe like I'm going heavier versus lighter. I'm going to do the more advanced skill option. And that resonated with them. They were like, wow, I kind of like that. Maybe I need to one. Hopefully they learn that maybe they underestimate themselves every once in a while. But then we learned, we're like, oh, okay, we need to make sure that we're not always giving, you know, that person that the kind of the, the safe, not, not necessarily the safe route. Cause we, we know that in our mind, like, light you know lighter doesn't mean easier lighter usually means faster for which example means which means harder but uh there's definitely a time and a place to 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 kind of reach on that a little bit so we're now and we're kind of we're already kind of on the topic but i think the the scaling conversation or like the modification thing is super important um okay here's a question so you have a brand new beginner 
You've got five by five back squat. That's the only thing. So Monday was five by five back. Just squat. had one of those on Monday. Yeah, we with did. a beginner. We did brand new beginner. <laughs> mm-hmm. Can't squat. Cannot like is like you know in CrossFit terminology has like an immature squat is kind of a like basically a train wreck. It's like this person needs squat therapy. But the only thing in class is squatting. Do you have them do five by five squat therapy, or do you? tailor do you tailor the the class to 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 be a little bit different or do you write them entirely you mean tailor the class to the entire group or just their specific workout i don't know Uh, well i I personally (laughs) would up the reps for more practice okay i would probably make them box squat or squat to a medicine ball because i want to beat the create the repeatability of the movement and create the awareness of what the squat is supposed to feel like and then I am going to be on them like fucking shit on a fly on a shit. If that's the expression, I mean, how, shit. Shit. how do you say this expression? Someone help me. White on rice. I'm going to be all over them to make sure that when they are moving, they are getting feedback. And again, what you have to be careful about when you have someone brand new like that is that you don't just ignore, shun the rest of your class. Ah, you fucking guys know what you're doing. And you only spend the entire hour with that one person. But typically when someone is doing that, I'm going to basically what I tell my coaches is you're going to distill it or boil it down to its basic components. I want you to be able to sit down and stand up safely. Very, very early on. That's like, I'm going to put a 24 inch box behind you. I'm going to tell you to keep your feet flat, your knees out and your chest up. And you're just going to squat down to that box and stand up. Great. You did a good job. Shorter box. Great. You did a good job. Shorter box. Great. You did a good job. Shorter box. Ah, shit, shorter box, didn't look very good. Let's go back up and do there. So what I would be doing with that athlete is basically trying to prove to them the safest range of motion that expresses the movement that we're trying to do, but sets them up with the opportunity to get better next time they come back to the gym. I'm not just going to haze them and be like, hey, you'll buy the fifth set. You'll figure out how to do this shit. Like, no, typically you would want to do is up the reps, lower the weight, or even take the weight away completely and have them practice the bare bones of the movement, which for a lot of people brand new, like I actually had a person in Wyndham that started about four months ago, day one, squatting three times to a box and standing back up was hard. Like getting up out of a chair before was like holding onto the arm rails and pulling themselves out of it. And now this person squats, you know, 50 pounds, which in three months time, going from being able to do stand up three times off a box to squat 50 pounds is like, you know, Hunter going from squatting 300 in this phase and at the end of the phase squatting 600. Like it's yeah. incredibly different. But you as a coach want to set up like breadcrumbs on the trail of like, hey, here's what you do today. Next time you come in, we'll go a little bit like this and a little bit like that. Kind of set them up on their like journey or quest towards getting this. But early on, it's about making sure the movement is safe and kind of expresses the fullest range of motion that they can get through safely. Same question. Yeah, it's the same answer. We just mm, did the okay. um, we just did the squat snatch phase, and I had a guy. We actually posted him on Instagram. <clears throat> yeah, uh, his squat snatch. And so basically, to give people an idea, like if you ask this person to do uh, overhead squat with a barbell, like you'd want to make sure his signature was legible on his waiver. Yeah, you know, yeah. like like, like, <laughs> like hey, is this guy the AD was on the yeah. the squat so rack. <laughs> our high CNS day was a squat snatch, you know, and so. Yeah. I basically just like made an assessment like, hey, it's week one. Like you can power snatch. Okay. I kind of like the the looks of that power snatch, put the barbell down, grab a PVC pipe. Here's your wall ball, overhead squat to a Wait, wall ball. Yeah. Seven weeks later, I we shot a video of him doing like a pretty like darn a 65, good. 65, 75 pound squat snatch. Like yeah. something like that. And yeah. that was probably one of like the biggest wins as a coach. Like I know there's other coaches that coach him in the morning, but from completely changing what we were doing you know seven weeks later there you go squat snatching 70 pounds and what's really important in this too is that you are as excited about it maybe more excited about it than he was because some athletes will get into the gym and be like well fuck i'm doing fucking helium balloon back squats and then someone else is over there 400 i'm not even doing the same thing it's like the hard part here is i'm going to try to relate this and how incredible it is the improvement you've made in the last seven weeks it's just it feels different because you don't have the two wheels on each side of your barbell, but it's tremendously different. Like the person I was talking about, Julia over in Wyndham, like it, she had a rough day at the gym and she's like, I'm always going to be the slowest person in the gym. I'm like, do you not remember two months ago when you couldn't get out of, you couldn't sit up of a box three times without getting out of breath? You are tremendously fitter already. And then when you go back around and kind of help them see back down the mountain, that's a huge part of what our job is. And 
again, most people gravitate towards the negative. Unfortunately, they, they think when someone hears a negative comment, they're more likely to remember that than like a hundred positive comments. So like one of the things I like to try to do is try to pump people up in a class. Like if I see something that it's the first time, like you should go over and celebrate that. And like one of the elements that we haven't talked about yet, and I don't know if Hunter's going to agree with me that CrossFit should be fun. You should have fun when you're at the CrossFit gym nah, occasionally. And again, I'm not I'm just teasing him because again, he does a really good job running an effective class and by no means is it not fun. But like, that's one thing I try to figure out, like how can I inject some level of fun in this? Whether that's, they all hate me because I made them do bike sprints ahead of back squat day, or it's just like, there's something new and unique about class. Or there's just an opportunity for them to kind of, you know, shoot the shit and have some fun. Like the back squat day, you talk about three and a half minutes of dead time. Like that's the time where you get to know your members talk to them about their life, figure out what makes them tick, and then be able to use that information to then help you coach them more effectively down the road. So, you know, I, I think an element of a CrossFit class needs to have some level of fun to it. Yeah, I think I'm going to backtrack because you cut me off before I could give my yeah, example. In your face. Fucking chicken fucker. <laughs> um, no, because, well, I think, because my answer is a little bit different than both of yours. So in my, my scenario, I'm thinking, I also like had an athlete in mind because we've been working on it. And I was actually referencing the, it was, it was a snatch day. It just, I, I kind of forgot that it was a snatch day, not a squat day, but it was like, okay, this person, like it's squat snatch day. It's, it's heavy snatch waves or whatever. And this person can't air squat. It's like, so, okay. Person can't, can barely air squat, which certainly means they can't PVC, can't even PVC pipe overhead squat. So how do we do this? It's kind of a combination, but, um, this person in my head as a coach, I'm always thinking kind of like, or there's an element of like the the hierarchy, the development of an athlete. It's like, okay, this person can barely squat and it's a lifting only day. Like this person's going to get something out of it, but I need them to like move for the entire hour. It's also a person who's not going to be moving a whole lot. So it's like, here's what you're going to do. We're going to set up this this wild squat therapy kind of, kind of apparatus here where you're going to squat safely to the safest depth that you can with the best mechanics that you possibly can and then you're going to hold a plank and then you're going to sit on a rower for 300 meters and you're going to do that and then you're going to like rest for one minute and you're going to do that for the entire window of time that i just gave everybody else who can elicit the stimulus that we're after snatching because this is going to in the long run benefit you far more who has just graduated beginners class and i don't necessarily like i'm not even confident that you can do five sets of 10 i can't even double the the number of squat reps that you can do because i think this person's going to get too tired their mechanics are going to break down and now what now like what are we going to do it's like when you have deconditioned athletes that are so far away from maybe like the group, the core group of your, your class, I think being able to personalize that a little bit with in the back of your head saying like, okay, this person is not, not only not going to get the stimulus that we're after, if we just tell them to squat, but they're also just not like, again, we need, I need this person to move for them as long as possible that I have them because I know that they're not doing that at their job. And this is going to be kind of the, the fastest route to improving their fitness so that eventually they can like, snap you know and you did keep an element of squat. what you'd be able to do to snatch sure yeah of course we so you like, didn't like to totally be like throw the you know papers in there and be like fuck this they can't snatch like you gave them an element of a snatch right an upright good looking squat as a part of their program sure. so like they still got the opportunity to work on some component of that movement but you decided to give them a version of that that's more effective where they are in their journey that's a great way to think about it you know i going back to the snatch example because we've used it a few times now another person over in winham same deal you know, it's squat snatch day. They've never pulled Olympic lift from the floor. Congratulations. You're going to go grab the training bar and we're going to do a lot of power position, power snatches until I like where your feet land every single time. Once I like where your feet land every single time, then we'll talk about introducing a quarter squat and then a half squat and then a three quarter squat yeah. squat until by the end of the class, this person is absolutely just dripping in sweat and they've used nothing more than 15 pounds for the entire hour. Mm -hmm. And that as a coach is our job to figure out like, if I can't get them to get the stimulus of like, let's say a heavy barbell, how do I ensure they get a good workout? Cause sure. that's kind of how I look at when I, you know, think about an effective CrossFit class is like, did the person who came in get a good workout? And like you said, in your example, if I just told them to go try to do a PVC pipe over a squat, one over a squat every 30 seconds for 20 minutes, that might not be as good a class. So it does take that extra wherewithal to be like, all right, where is this person in their fitness journey? And what is the most appropriate dose of fitness for them based on the goal of getting them to be able to do class with everybody else? Yeah, I think a lot of times when we think about like scaling and <clears throat> modifying, we're like, how can we 
replicate as closely as possible exactly what everybody else is doing when it's like again if it's a squat snatch day do we like and this person can't move a pvc pipe overhead like are you know how how far do we go in that direction before we say okay we're gonna we're gonna do something a little bit different it's gonna it's gonna it's gonna kind of smell like what everybody else is doing but it's it's gonna be more tailored to you and i think a lot of times we just think like well if they can't back squat maybe they goblet squat or they front squat or they do something as similar as possible without the consideration of like what does this person actually need like in the grand scheme of things as someone who just finished up beginners and doesn't know the difference between a snatch and a back squat it's like okay that person doesn't need to know how to get to power position just yet that person needs to exercise for an extended period of time when they're at your gym and obviously there's instances where that's not appropriate but i think having the wherewithal to identify a person who's like are they going to be okay with this one is it going to is it going to isolate them to be doing something so different are they are they like meant are they going to be like psychologically okay with doing something different knowing that it's more beneficial to them or do you, is it like okay let's have a conversation about why i'm going to have you do this or maybe it is like as long as i know you're going to come back in tomorrow maybe we will just worry about the lifting stuff because i know you're really in like you drank the kool-aid you're going to be back tomorrow no or like no matter what what else? That was kind of like the whole class. You dove into the fun thing, so that's. I, I got one more element um, too. Yeah, go but hammer it. The last one's just like the. There needs to be some sort of social element. If you are mm -hmm. a CrossFit coach and you don't enjoy getting to know people and socializing, or at least you aren't able to at least flip that switch for the hour you're on the floor, like you are an introvert, this is going to be a very challenging job for you. Like it's just going to be challenging because again part of what allows them to believe in you and believe what you have to say is that you get to know them and you know enough about them and enough about their, not just when they're in the gym, but about them to figure out like what, what scratches their itch or motivates them to want to keep coming back in and trying to create that between you and the athlete and then athlete to athlete as well. That's sort of what I was getting at with like the, you know, the hazing warm up every once in a while. Like I'm fine with them not liking me all that much if that makes them have some sort of shared suffering where they're like, they went through it together and now they have a tighter bond because they did my terrible Monday afternoon warm up ahead of five by five back squat, which is supposed to be a fun time. And all we did was get hazed for the first 15 minutes of class. Like there's a element to a CrossFit gym that's hard to put into words because there's no like perfect formula for how it's done. Um, you know, one of the things that we did during the pandemic to allow for cleaning was create a half hour separation between our classes, but not only has that continued past, you know, the heydays of the pandemic, but it allows us as coaches to get a chance to socialize with members and chance for members from one class to socialize with another class that's kind of coming in without it being in direct conflict of me being like, hey, get your ass over the whiteboard. I'm telling you what class is today. So I think a huge part of what makes a gym successful is figuring out how to make the community spend time together, not just during the 21, 15 and nines. And you know, figuring out how to do that, whether that's question of the day or playing games in your warm up, or, you know, hey, we're gonna make sure we have 10 minutes at the end of cooling, cooling down and we talk about what we learned in class or like what's coming up in the week or what you're doing for the holidays. Like that element I think is really important because again, it builds that commonality between you and somebody else. Like how does anyone, you know, become a friend with somebody else? And that's because they get to know them and they figure out like what's, you know, what's about them that makes them who they are. And that's a huge part of being able to figure out like, psychological tolerance for exercise, physiological tolerance for exercise, what what they like to do, what they don't like to do. And that helps inform you kind of going back to like learning something. Again, the coaches need to learn as they go about this too, how you can be a more effective coach for that individual athlete. And then how does that athlete relate to everybody else? It's kind of in on the floor at the same time. <clears throat> yeah. So I think my classes have uh, gotten more fun recently mm. and uh, I've been like trying to drill down what I think the change was. And I had this moment where I was in the middle of like a 20 minute workout, 18 minute workout. I was coaching, I was moving around the room and I was like, I haven't said anything to anyone in like a couple of like moments. Mm -hmm. Like this is bad. And then I thought, well, these are my people. No one needs to hear anything right now because I'm watching them mm. 
what am I doing? Am I coaching to impress a make-believe hunter who's not watching my <laughs> class? Yeah. Am I? Am I'm I in your head? Am I coaching to impress a make-believe seminar staff? Like, am I? Am I searching for things to find to give people because I think that's what I'm supposed to do, or am I organically being a CrossFit coach to the person I am near? And when I did that. A, it just allowed me to like move away from these moments of like, okay, I have to be doing something like na naturally. I don't have my hands in my pockets. I do move my move around the room because you yelled at me when I first started. Mm. But Who's the statue. But um, and I don't hold a PVC pipe. I was a, I was a big PVC cigar. pipe holder. <laughs> you, you <laughs> nice good cigar. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think some of us get just lost in the weeds of like trying to write this beautiful elaborate game like warm up because like what would some observer think of it and just maybe spend more time like the people in my class mm. how am i going to be a crossfit coach to them and i've used this term a lot but like or just facilitating an hour of fitness right and i needed to drop a lot of the baggage like make believe seminar staff or you yeah. sitting in the corner and and my class is just got more fun as soon as I started to do Well, that. I mean, like, it's one of those things where it's like we talk, occasionally we'll talk about how, like, if you're not moving around the room, if you're not coaching people actively, like, you, you're just being that facilitator. And that's, that's true if that's what you do most of the time, right? That's not always the case where it's like, I, I know that when I'm taking class, like, I rarely hear what a coach says, especially if it's like yelled over like music or whatever, aside from like the occasional, here's how long you have left or, or in the workout or whatever. Like I don't hear, I don't hear all that much. I don't, maybe that's because I don't listen all that much. I'm usually just kind of like do, I'm, I'm the kind of athlete who just like, I've done this for long enough that I know generally how to do, you know, how to do everything and what, how this is going to go and whatnot. So I kind of just get in my zone and decide whether I'm going to try hard today or it's more of a participation medal. But like, there are plenty of instances where it's like the best, the best thing is just like walking around and make sure people are safe. And like, every, it looks like everybody's working pretty hard and they're like focusing on their thing. It's like, shut the fuck up. You don't need to say, you don't need to say anything every single time you remind people the occasional this, this or that, or give them a, a brief cue if it's something they're working on. But like, you don't need to be running your mouth the whole time. And, and especially if you don't do, if it's as long as that's not your MO where it's like you rarely ever coach, then it's obviously like you're a facilitator. If you, a coach who is just going to selectively choose to, to say like, Hey, I don't like, I don't necessarily see anything that needs to be addressed. Like don't you don't have to do that every single time that's funny i was actually thinking the opposite <laughs> really well i'm gonna i want to clarify what i mean by that like i actually completely agree with your statement i tell uh tell coaches that i work with who are trying to become better coaches that like i don't know if you're a basketball fan but if you ever watch steph curry play basketball like he does it to the, the absolute perfect degree if you watch him move without the basketball there's a reason why the motherfucker scores like 30 points every single game and just is f so phenomenal for someone who's comes from like a minor D one school like he did. But the fact that he's constantly working the room or working the basketball court allows him to find shots. I think coaches work in a very similar way. If you are standing in one spot, the entire class, you are missing a shitload of what's happening. So while I don't think you need to run your mouth constantly, I think the movement is really important. And sure, I do think course, it goes that, a long ways. Yeah. If occasionally, you, instead of just being like, your feet are on the wrong spot or push your knees out or get your arms over your head, you say, hey, that was good a little bit faster next time. It has a little bit of a cheerleading vibe to it, but it's not just like, good job, everybody, good job. I think it's important for athletes to know that you are in the room and present at all times. So while I agree, I don't think someone should stand at the whiteboard and you know have pom-poms and cheer the entire hour. I think it's important for coaches not to get lost in the sauce. So like if someone were to casually walk in off the street, it shouldn't take them 15 minutes to figure out who's running the show. Like, and again, I don't think you need to run your mouth every 30 seconds, but if someone were to come in off the street that doesn't know anything about CrossFit, they could identify you as the leader of this group in some form or fashion within a few minutes. And I think that's an important element because if someone hears my voice, even if it's not directed at them, they know my eyes are out on the floor and I'm seeing stuff that maybe, oh, I try to get away with a fast one, but then I heard him in earshot five feet away. I know he's probably coming to me next. I better fix the way I move. So while I don't wanna scare someone into moving better, I do like the idea of like, hey, you heard my voice. You might not know what I said, but you heard my voice. So you know that you should be on notice for like, hey, 
they are watching how we move because that's what they pay for. They pay to be coached by us. So while I do agree that if you're just cheerleading all the time, that's not a good coaching experience. I do like the element of making sure that you are present. And a lot of times for me, that just ends up being my voice because it's one of my strengths, being able to use my loud voice to the entire room. You might not be that at that coach that coaches that way, but finding a way to make sure your athletes feel like you are present is really important because I think if you're checked out, they're going to check out. Yeah, it's just balance, right? Yeah, of course. I guess that's my saying too balance. Too far that side, too far that side. It really is, unfortunately, <clears throat> like everything in life, there's just a happy medium. Yep. I'm trying to think, is there anything else on, that we didn't we yeah, didn't really hit on? That's go, important. Go final thoughts, really. If you got if we if we got any. Yeah, I mean, when the f- final thoughts are here is like you might find that you know I don't think we categorize things into a perfect list of like here are the seven things you need to be to be a successful or a uh, you know component successful CrossFit class, but there's probably one of those things that we've talked about today that you're not good at. Pour effort and energy into that. Just try to do one of these things better and see how your classes change. Like I said, I think what you described kind of wasn't your final thoughts, but you said a few minutes ago is like stop trying to impress the imaginary person who's not there. That's a really good thing for you to practice because it takes pressure off you and it makes your class more about like what can Mark do without you know worrying about who's back here telling me that this is good or this is bad. Like I think it's an important part of your class. So you know if you heard something on the list and you're like, man, I don't think I do that. This is a perfect kind of swift kick in the ass to be like, all right, here's something I could do that can make a big difference in my class. And I think, you know, if you've got a room of people, there's probably, you know, four or five of you, I don't know, that all have different things that you do really well, maybe one thing you don't do well. When you combine all of those personalities into a coaching staff, now you're probably checking off most of these boxes. And now you have a, you know, class experience where someone comes to 5 a, five a.m., they get a little bit different experience than they come they come at 9 a.m. or 3.30 or 5 p.m. Like, and that is what's really cool about a CrossFit gym and something I try to encourage beginners to do. I'm like, once you leave my, you know, you leave the nest and you're no longer in my beginner's class, go to as many different hours on our schedule as possible. You might find that there's a coach that you really resonate with and they speak your language and you might perform better with them than you ever would with me, even though you learn this stuff from me in the first nine classes. Like, go experience that. And that is a really big part of what I think makes a CrossFit community so special is that there's so many different walks of life from the athlete perspective and on the coaching side. Take your classes. Take other <laughs> coaches' classes. It's mm. I think that's like the, the you learn a lot. thought. You learn so much from it. <clears throat> so... <clears throat> Take affiliate class often, different times, weird times. Yeah, I think uh, getting, getting, especially if you don't frequently, getting feedback from other coaches, we do it a little bit more formally here more often than, or not more often, we do it at this point a couple times a year, like formally, but I think informally as well. There We have, you know, there's a coaches group, the, our coaches group chat is is alive and well and sometimes too alive for me personally but uh, <laughs> there's a lot of interaction that occurs when we talk about whether it's a combination of so and so a so and so got hurt or so and so came in with a tweak so and so came in with a blood clot needed to go to the hospital somewhere <laughs> like that actually happened so and so is like oh hey like wow, anybody like going to 5 a.m. class with me? Anybody uh, like, hey, how'd everybody enjoy hazing their their class today? Like that sort of thing. There's a there's a camaraderie amongst the coaches group. And I think that um, that tightness kind of gets gets pushed down, kind of the top trickles down. trickles down to everybody else because we don't, I don't, I don't like the idea of forcing all of the coaches to run the class the exact same way. I like the idea of giving everybody autonomy for like, Hey, you write your own warm up. Decide whether you want to do the lift first or the metcon first, or however you want to do this. Like, do it because I think everybody has the the competence to maintain the integrity of the program and give everybody a good workout. But I think um, facilitating a kind of a, a community, a, a, a a small little tribe within your coaching staff uh, can really help facilitate like pushing that stuff down to members because I think m- members can identify if it's like if you just have if you just have five coaches that obviously don't, maybe they don't interact or they don't talk or they're maybe on a separate kind of separate wavelengths versus a group of coaches who, despite the fact that their classes might look a little bit different, like everybody's fucking tracking on the program because they, one, they, they know what they're doing from like a, from a, from a knowledge perspective. And two, like every one of our classes, including our two CrossFit games, athletes take every one of our coaches including our two games athletes will take class from 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 time to time all the way to like 
Now, that's the only program that I do. I just take class when I, you know, as long as my schedule allows. I think we did it. Yeah, I think so too. Sweet. All right. Thanks everyone for listening. You just listened to an episode of the Coaches Podcast. Um, don't forget, Misfit Athletics Training Camp is happening at Misfit HQ the last week of the Open. That's 23.3 March 3rd, I believe is the... is 23.3. March 3rd is 23.3. You can show up for that camp is the 4th through the 5th. Um, and we encourage, like, along with athletes who want to get better and be ready to perform at quarterfinals, we love talking to coaches about coaching. And there's a, always a decent number of athletes who come uh, who are either affiliate coaches or consider themselves more coach than athlete. Um, and we love shooting the shit with coaches coaches as just as much as we do about teaching athletes the the finer point of the snatch so uh get your tickets at misfit.camp we'd love to have you we'll catch you guys next time